Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the little glitch. Um, my name is uh, Eddie Cassidy, and I'm chairman of ILFA. And um, two things I'd just like to say at the start of today's um, meeting is that uh, our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people at this point in time, um, struggling under terrible conditions, and um, just that we would like to keep them in our minds today and for days in the future as well. One other little note as I have, I do, I am of the opinion that we have overseas uh, visitors. So um, welcome them on board and uh, I hope they enjoy today. So today we hold our first virtual patient information day of 2020. I have a great panel of speakers lined up and um, we are very grateful to them for their time, their expertise, and hope uh, you will enjoy their presentations. As always with virtual technology, we hope everything will run smoothly for us. And as I say, we have we are very grateful to have Justin on the hand just to help us out with any technical issues. The order of speakers this morning is Dr. Sinead Walsh. Dr. Michelle Murray, Elaine Craven. We then will take a small, short comfort break and we will re rejoin you with Sarah Cunin, Professor Brendan Kelly, and Dermot Raftery. Questions can be submitted via the chat function on the bottom of the screen and they will be raised after each presentation. So if I may go to the first speaker, our first speaker is Dr. Sinead Walsh. Dr. Walsh is a consultant respiratory physician with specialist, specialist interest in pulmonary fibrosis who works in Galway University Hospital. She is also a lecturer in medical education in the National University of Ireland, Galway. Dr. Walsh's presentation is entitled Pulmonary Fibrosis. The basics. So Dr. Walsh, if I can hand over to you now. Perfect. Thank you, Eddie. I'll just share my slides. Perfect. Tonight, if you want to just go to full screen there. Yeah. I've gone to full screen. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah perfect. perfect. Okay, so thanks a million and thanks a million for the invite um, from ILFA to let me talk today. So I'm going to um, basically set the scene, I think, for the rest of the morning. So my job is to just um, talk about pulmonary fibrosis and the basics. Um, so when we talk about pulmonary fibrosis, I suppose first of all, we have to look at what is uh, the normal lung. So we have our normal lung here um, on the left hand side of the screen. So we have our breathing tubes. They get smaller and smaller and smaller um, until you approach the periphery of the lung. And then at the edge of the lung, we have the little air sacs and we call them um, alveoli. And normally um, the space in between the alveoli should be very, very thin. That's to allow for oxygen to come in uh, into the body and for carbon dioxide to come out. But in pulmonary fibrosis, what you have is you've got a thickening. You've got this irregular thickening of the tissue in between the alveoli. And that's basically what we're dealing with when we're talking about pulmonary fibrosis. So this is another way to look at what I just said there. So the breathing tubes again, and then at the end of the breathing tubes in the normal alveoli, this is up here at the top is the alveolus and down here is the blood vessel. And this space should be really, really thin. And this space is what we call the interstitium. Um, and this should be very, very thin to allow oxygen to come into the blood vessel and to let the blood vessel carry the oxygen around the body and for carbon dioxide to come out. But what you have in pulmonary fibrosis or what we also call in interstitial lung disease, because we're looking at this space, which is the interstitium, we have this damaged and thickened interstitium. So what that means is that oxygen is very slow to move into the blood, and then carbon dioxide is very slow to move out um, um, out of the body into the alveolus to be, be taken out of the body. So often patients with pulmonary fibrosis, when they're at rest and when they're sitting down, they don't, you know, they don't notice any symptoms, but it's when they get up to move around to walk that the body the lungs, the, uh, the alveoli, they're not able to keep up with the increased oxygen demands, and that's why symptoms occur. Um, there's lots of different causes or types of pulmonary fibrosis. 
um, you can have them related to an exposure. Um, so when uh, the doctor sees you first and they're querying pulmonary fibrosis, they're going to ask you, were you ever exposed to particular drugs? We know particular drugs can cause fibrosis. And um, there's environmental exposures as well. There, you can be exposed to um, dusts, um, asbestos, bird droppings, um, animal droppings. It can be related to conditions and the conditions are often rheumatological conditions such as arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, um, and there's lots of different ones there. And then there's this unknown cause and the unknown is what we call idiopathic. And there's lots of different types of unknown causes of fibrosis, but the most common would be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And that just basically means that we've done a good hunt to look for the other causes of fibrosis and we can't find another underlying cause, we're going to label it then as idiopathic or unknown. So I stole this slide from Ilfa, but I really, really like it. Um, there's lots of, of symptoms and um, signs of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the first symptom that people will notice is shortness of breath on exertion. And um, so if they're going up the stairs, they might find their exercise tolerance has reduced. If previously they were able to walk five kilometers a day, suddenly they're struggling after two or three kilometers. Um, and patients can sometimes put this down to increasing um, old age or oh, sure, I'm getting old, you know, like, you know, that's it, fine. And that can sometimes lead to a delay in patients um, seeking help for their symptoms. And um, there's often a chronic dry cough. So no sputum. Uh, the cough is there. It's persistent and it's a dry cough. And um, if they're fatigued, they're running on low battery, they're feeling very fatigued and this can interfere with their quality of life. They're working hard at breathing. You're, you're working hard at breathing while breathing should be an automatic thing that you don't have to think about. In pulmonary fibrosis, you start to work hard at breathing. Then on your clinical examination, the most, um, the most common clinical examination is when the doctor listens to the stethoscope at the back of the chest and up under the arms, they can hear these um, crepitations or these crackles, these Velcro-like crackles, and um, that's, that's the most common sign. And then 30 to 50% of patients can notice this clubbing or this rounding of their fingertips. And that's why the doctor looks at your fingertips just to see, do you have this sign called clubbing? We don't know why clubbing occurs, but it, it is associated with pulmonary fibrosis. So who's at risk of getting idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Well, men and women can, go, can both get it, but it is more common in men. It's more common with increasing age over the age of 60. Um, both smokers and non-smokers can get it, but it is more common in ex-smokers. And approximately 5% of cases will have a genetic component. And that's why we'll ask, is there a family history of pulmonary fibrosis um, in terms of first degree relatives? And my colleague, um, Professor Killian Hurley in um, Beaumont is doing a lot of work um, in this area of genetic pulmonary fibrosis. So investigations, um, we start off with a chest X-ray and some breathing tests. Um, the lungs often look very, very small on chest X-ray. That's the first sign. And we see little bits of scarring around the edges of the lung. When we do breathing tests, um, there's a particular type of pattern that we can see in breathing tests as well. Um, and we call that restriction. So our lungs are fibrosed and thickened and hard, and we see a restriction type pattern on breathing tests. And then we monitor breathing tests over time um, to see how um, the breathing tests are doing. Um, everyone will need a CT scan of the chest as well um, if we're querying pulmonary fibrosis. And bloods, there's no diagnostic test for pulmonary fibrosis, but the main reason for doing bloods is to, you're looking, well, you're going to have done a clinical examination first, looking to see how the, you know, to the arthritis type things, you're going to look and see, does the, do you have any clinical signs of arthritis or anything like that? But you'll do the bloods as well, looking to see, is there any blood test evidence of um, arthritis? Um, because idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a diagnosis of exclusion when you've outruled the other things. Uh, the CT scan in pulmonary fibrosis in IPF is really, really important. Um, and the way I always like to think about it and explain it is like the lungs are like a sponge. So your sponge should be nice and um, new and fresh and nice and spongy. But in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you get um, a thickening and hardening of the sponge. And it starts off at the bottom of the lungs, at the edges of the lungs, all right? And this is another way of looking at it here. This is the lung. It's the, the bottom of the lung that will be affected and up around the side of the lung, okay? And then as, as the fibrosis um, develops over time, it works its way upwards. Um, and we look for particular types of pattern on the CT scan. Um, that fibrosis that I mentioned about, that pattern on a CT scan, if we see it, we often see honeycombing. 
So up here at the top of the lung, that's an area of normal lung. It's normal lung here too. But down the bottom, you can see these big circles. All right, these big circles, that's the, that's the area of fibrosis and that's called honeycombing. So up here, you're going to have effect of gas exchange. Your lung is doing its job. But down here, the lung isn't able to do its job. You've got this honeycombing. And this is just a, basically a diagram showing what's on the CT scan here. The big circles, the honeycombing. And then the airways should get smaller and smaller and smaller as you approach the edge of the lung. But if you've got all this honeycombing and fibrosis and this hardening going on, it pulls the airways open either side. Um, if a patient... Um, um, is um, query pulmonary fibrosis. It's really, really important that their case is discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. Um, and at this meeting, we have a group of um, specialists in um, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. We'll have the respiratory doctor who saw you and who took the history and who did the clinical examination. The radiology doctor who has a special interest in looking at pulmonary fibrosis scans. A rheumatology doctor is very, very useful as well. That's the arthritis doctor. If some of those bloods came back a little bit strange, it can be really, really useful to have a rheumatology doctor there as well. A pathology doctor can be there as well if the person had a biopsy, which you don't need a biopsy to make a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If you've got the particular history and if you've got a particular scan that is very, very suggestive of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And a really, really important part of the MDT is the fibrosis clinical nurse specialist, um, a really, really important part. So that we, we sit around and we look at cases and we'll present the case. We'll say Mr. X, 12 month history of shortness of breath and a dry cough. Bloods are normal. We'll bring up the CT scan. We look for particular patterns on a CT scan. There's lots of different unusual patterns. So it's really, really important that we get consensus from a group before we label this as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, the treatment of IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis up until 2014, we really didn't have effective treatments. But thankfully, since 2014, we have two antifibrotic drugs that are very, very good. So IPF by its nature is a progressive disease. It's going to get worse. But the antifibrotic drugs have been shown to slow down the disease progression. And it's really, really important that um, that we understand that it's not going to reverse the fibrosis that's there, it's not going to halt it in its tracks, but it's going to slow it down. And the studies have shown that antifibrotic drugs have been shown to slow down the rate of disease progression. There's two drugs, there's perfenidone or esbriate, and then there's nintedinib or ofev. So perfenidone, wow. uh, take that three times a day, you have to do a dose increase for the first two weeks. The main side effect of that is a rash, which is worse with sunlight. So um, we'd advise wearing the factor 50. It can cause stomach upset and um, you need a regular blood test monitoring to check the liver function tests. Nintedinib or Ofev, we um, that's taken twice a day. There's no dose increase required. The main side effect of that is diarrhea. So we'd have to warn about that. And um, often we give Imodium as well, just in case it's... Um, um, bothersome and that requires blood test monitoring as well and um, liver function tests too. Uh, the other treatments of IPF pulmonary rehab, oxygen, lung transplant, symptom control and palliative care. I'm going to leave that to my colleagues to talk about because they're the, the, the specialists in that area. I just want to mention um, oxygen um, ambulatory oxygen, oxygen that you wear um, you know when you're not when you're sitting down at rest but oxygen when you're walking. Um, it may increase up your exercise capacity. So you may be able to walk further and reduce down the, the degree of shortness of breath when you're walking around. Um, but sometimes patients don't like it. And the evidence for oxygen isn't as good as for other lung conditions. Um, so it would have to be um, an individual decision between you and, and the doctor who's looking after you. Um, I think this is a very, very useful slide. And I usually like to draw it at clinic when I see patients as well. When we diagnose you with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, if you look up the guidelines, the guidelines say, you know, that it's a progressive disease. It's um, uh, three to five years. But we don't know how you're going to do, really. We're seeing you at a snapshot in time up here, OK? And we have patients coming back a couple of years later, way over the five years, and they've remained very, very stable. Um, and then they say, well, you, you, you didn't tell me I was going to do this good. But we don't know. And some we do have patients who are very, very stable. 
all right and they're um they, they don't lose lung function over time or if they do it's just more what you see with increasing age more more commonly we probably have patients who have a slow progression so they're progressing slowly over time and they're on this slow trajectory and then unfortunately we do have patients who have a very very rapid progression and who whose outcome will be bad regardless of what we do um, and we don't know the only way we'll know that is how you do and how you get on and regular monitoring for you over time and the regular monitoring is how you're doing symptom wise how your exercise and we monitor the lung function and we can do six minute walk tests as well to measure that. Unfortunately, you see these bolts here, bolts do occur. These are bolts that we call these acute exacerbations or an acute worsening of symptoms. So you could be very, very stable for, you know, um, a long period of time. And it's, for some reason, the fibrosis, it's like turning on a light switch. The fibrosis suddenly just becomes active. That is very, very serious when that happens. And um, patients have to come into hospital, they need oxygen, they need steroids, they need antibiotics. Um, because we're just trying to see can we can we fix it? Some people do okay, and um, some people don't. And sometimes you can have a new baseline after that occurs. Um, and I think this is kind of useful to know that the, the natural history um, of pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm nearly there, but the National um, Patient Charter for um, IPF, I think this is really, really useful and it's basically a nice little uh, summary. So it's basically the, the key, the six key areas of care that patients are entitled to. So an early and accurate diagnosis. And as I said, um, presenting early with symptoms and having that um, MDT discussion, that multidisciplinary team meeting discussion with all the experts, clear information about IPF, um, access to the antifibrotic medications and oxygen, access to pulmonary rehab and exercise programs, early referral to the National Lung Transplant Unit with a minimal emphasis on age. And um, um, I leave that to, to um, Michelle Murray. And then access to psychological and palliative care services. Really, really important as well. And that'll be covered elsewhere today. Um, I think there was a small query about um, flying um, and should you fly if you've got um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Um, the evidence out there isn't great, all right? Um, but when you go up to altitude, yes, your, your oxygen levels are going to drop. And patients with IPF don't tolerate that drop in oxygen levels as well as other patients with other lung conditions. Um, IPF patients, they're less able to withstand the low oxygen levels at altitude. Um, and it's very much dependent. You know, we don't know, you know, you really have to discuss with your doctor. Are you a very stable patient? Are you progressing? You know, and we want to know what your degree of lung function is like, because some patients will be able to tolerate it better than others as well. And if you are flying, you are flying to a foreign country. And you have to be beware as well that we, you know, we don't want you to get unwell in a foreign country because um, that would be risky as well. Um, so that's it. That's all I had to um, say. So thank you again for ILFA for the invite. And I'm happy to take any questions. Well done there. Sinead, it wasn't as scary as, as you thought, was it? No, it was no, fine. No, OK, <laughs> uh, we, I have a couple of questions coming in. Um, if, if the attendees can use the Q&A box, uh, that means that all the uh, speakers can see the questions and we can also type them if we don't get to them straight away. Um, Matt asked, now this might not be a question for Sinead, it might be for any of the other panellists here, um, how often should CT scans be carried out with in a patient's journey with PF? There's no guidelines around this, all right, there's no guidelines, um, so there's no, you know, it has to be done at a particular time, obviously a diagnosis. If a patient has worsening symptoms, you'd obviously want to repeat a scan as well. And if the patient is very, very stable, you don't need to repeat CTs. But if there's a drop in lung function and worsening symptoms, then it is very, very useful to repeat a CT as well. And um, so no guidelines, but it's very much patient uh, dependent. Um, um, OK. Yeah, an uh, anonymous uh, attendee asked, should you have a CT scan yearly? This sort of answers the question that one cannot see the rate of disease if left for three or four disease yeah it's it's dependent on symptoms and change in lung function as well you wouldn't like there's no there's no guidelines that say you need a ct scan every year it's much more you know when you're following up those patients in clinic it's very much symptoms and lung function and um, and then if there's any drop then absolutely yes um is there mucus gene involved in ipf and is there any work in this area to treat or cure ipf yeah, there is that MUC5B gene um, and um, there is work. Um, I'm not an expert in this area at all, but as I said, um, Prof Killian Hurley in, um, in the RCSI and the matter is doing a lot of work into um, 
into genes and looking at familial cases. Um, um, and he's happy to take referrals from throughout Ireland if there is a, a family history. And um, so if you have relatives with IPF and you have IPF, he's happy to take relative um, to take referrals um, there and to perform further um, investigations. Thank you, Justin. And thanks again, Dr. Walsh, for your presentation. Very detailed. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Murray. And Dr. Murray is a consultant lung respiratory physician, clinic and lead for lung transplantation and clinical lecturer and assistant professor of medicine at University College Dublin and the Matter University Hospital here in Dublin as well. Dr. Murray's presentation is entitled Lung Transplantation for IPF. Am I a candidate? So Dr. Murray, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope everyone can hear me and see my slides okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Great, brilliant, okay. So just an outline of the talk today, I'm not going to dwell too much on the background of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because Dr. Welch has already done that. But um, the, I will go a little bit about, because I see people with more advanced lung failure. So how do I know I'm getting worse? What should I report to the doctor? What kind of thing are we looking out for? The real importance of oxygen and pulmonary rehab, I will just go into that in a little bit of detail because I see that quite a bit in clinic and, and um, people may not be on the right amount. So just to kind of talk about that a little. Who is able to have a lung transplant? Why a lung transplant may, may not always be your best option and the reasons why you may not be suitable. The role that I play in the MDT and a transplant assessment. And then I'll move on a little bit on life on the list. The surgery, I have a video of a surgery, so hopefully that will play okay. And then life after. So not dwelling too much on this because it's been covered already, but it is very important that to stress that patients, when they have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they may not initially at diagnosis um, when they're sitting down, notice any shortness of breath. But over time, unfortunately, the scarring of the lung tends to damage that area within the lung where oxygen and carbon dioxide work to try and exchange. So patients often come and they say they'll only notice short of breath and exertion, and then over time that may then get worse. But it is really important to monitor the shortness of breath and the amount of things that you can do, because that often will give you a guideline into how severe things are becoming. It's already been discussed how difficult sometimes the diagnosis is for us as clinicians and the importance of a multidisciplinary team committee. And there's lots of different realms of fibrosis that fit into a big category there on the right side. So how do I know that I'm getting worse? Well, I suppose more breathless doing tasks that you could do before after you have your diagnosis. Do you find that you're walking, the ability to walk distance is less, you're more short of breath? Things that maybe you enjoy, like gardening or DIY, become a little bit more difficult. You're finding difficulty going up the stairs. You know, maybe making the bed is often a difficult one. Hoovering, washing, dressing, all these things that are now getting a little bit more difficult are often the things that patients report to me um, that they notice that their disease is getting worse. I do advise patients to get a pulse oximeter and these are the, I have a picture of it soon uh, to show you what I mean. These are the little um, oximeters that you can put on your finger. This often gives us an idea on when patients are walking and if their oxygen levels are dropping. So if they're dropping less than 90% or so when they're walking, and this is either on oxygen or off oxygen. If you're not on any oxygen, it may mean that you might need oxygen. Or if you are on oxygen and it's dropping, it might mean that you might need more. And patients often come to me in clinic and they are not on the right amount of oxygen. So they're actually really short of breath doing a lot of these common tasks. And I, um, a lot of our work then is to try and get them on the right amount of oxygen so that they can begin to have a normal life again and try and do some of the things that they enjoy. It is true to say that infections make, can make pulmonary fibrosis worse. And patients often come to me that have been stable, unfortunately get a bad infection. It can be a cold or it doesn't have to be a nasty one. 
and they become more breathless because unfortunately in pulmonary fibrosis, the lung reserve is not as strong as it should be. And any hit to those lungs will unfortunately make people a little worse and the scarring can get bad. Worsening of swelling ankles and feet, obviously that can be heart as well as lungs, but sometimes in the context of pulmonary fibrosis, it can also re reflect that the right hand side of the heart, which is connected to the lung, is getting a little bit more swollen. And sometimes these patients will need further investigation and they might, might need to take water pills to, uh, to try and relieve uh, the heart and relieve the fluid. Losing muscle and weight loss is very important in pulmonary fibrosis and it's common. Unfortunately, it is also a side effect of some of the antifibrotics, uh, the medications that patients would be on, but it's also a side effect of the worsening of the disease because you're breathing at such a high rate, the calories that you need and burn are very, very high. And patients can come to me with lots of muscle wasting uh, and having lost quite a significant amount. So that often is quite worrying and we'll get our dietitians uh, to see these patients. Reflux symptoms can clear pulmonary fibrosis. So we often place, place patients on um, anti-ulcer medication to try and stop any um, acid going into patients' mouths or because if there is this constant hit of acid, that can very easily go into the lung and attack it. Poor appetite is often associated with this disease as well. This is multifactorial. It can be from the medications and just can be from the overall chronicity of the disease. When you see your lung doctor, they often will perform a lung function test and a six minute walk test. These are really important tests because they tell us over time how patients are doing. And there are certain numbers within this test that we compare with because often with pulmonary fibrosis, it's more a trajectory or a look over time to see how patients are doing. And there are certain numbers if they're dropping over time, will alert the lung doctor to maybe refer a patient for lung transplant. It is true to say that patients with a family history of pulmonary fibrosis are, um, are at a, a greater risk of, of progressing um, faster than patients that are not. So it is important, um, it's mentioned to the doctor that if there is a relative that has had it before, that that may, uh, may, may, may make your condition a little bit more uh, serious. So um, this has already been dealt with already, but just to reiterate that when a patient comes, uh, um, uh, this is the patient journey, when the patient is initially um, diagnosed with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that often uh, there can be a delay in the diagnosis because sometimes it can be vague enough symptoms and um, it, the patient may be looked after initially by the GP. And then when well, on basis of a chest X-ray or persistent symptoms, the patient is sent to a lung doctor and then the MDT happens where there are all those specialists that Dr. Walsh talked about. And patients then are, are looked after by their primary lung care team but over time, if things are deteriorating, um, some of these patients, if they fit into our criteria, they may come to us for an opinion on whether lung transplant would be an option for this particular patient. There is a, a very big and broad range of management um, of care for patients with pulmonary fibrosis, and it ranges from the drugs, oxygen, family support is really important, Vaccines are really important, and I would like to stress that patients, um, when the you, you know deterioration of lung function is often based on viral of uh, infections, which of course we've no control over. Except I would suggest that strongly that patients get their fourth vaccine. Um, unfortunately, we have lost many patients both pre and, and post lung transplant due to COVID-19. So it's important that we vaccinate patients and patients um, uh, make, making sure that they're vaccinated with, to the fourth vaccine and making sure every, all their household contacts are also vaccinated. It's important that we manage all the other medical problems that patients may have with pulmonary fibrosis. And that includes, as I mentioned, weight loss, 
if there's heart disease, mood is also important and, and um, any anxiety and low mood that people would have. I'm going to go into a, a little bit on pulmonary rehab because that's really, really important for patients. And then uh, talk a little bit about, about evaluation for transplant. So pulmonary rehabilitation is exercise for the lungs in, in the want of a better word. And there are many great pulmonary rehab units that are both virtual and the ILFA have one weekly with which many of my patients go and attend and absolutely love. Um, and now um, there might be new um, pulmonary rehab classes starting up around the country, but many I, I suspect are still on a virtual mode. Pulmonary rehab is important because people with pulmonary fibrosis lose a lot of muscle and they lose it at an alarming rate. And it is important that to keep the strength and keep strong, and it's important even if you're for transplant or not, that we have you as strong as we possibly can. So in case you get an infection or something happens, that you're at a better ebb to try and fight it. Patients who are considered for lung transplant almost go through a period of pulmonary rehab and they have, they, we strongly recommend that they have a stationary bike and an exercise program at home. It is important to say that patients who have, who are on oxygen, they will always need higher amounts of oxygen when they go and do exertion. And for some exercises, they might need more so it is important to talk to your physiotherapist or nurse. It is also important that you keep an eye on your pulse oximeter, which is this little machine here on the right side. What we don't want to happen, and we often see this, is, is patients are dropping down into the low 80s, 70s when they do exercise. If that happens, you've got to stop and you've got to phone your nurse or physiotherapist because you need at that point an evaluation of your lungs and probably a reassessment for your oxygen. Down on the right hand side is a little device called an Inogen. And an Inogen device is a small portable device that many patients will use for ambulatory or walking oxygen. As your oxygen needs increase, there are different devices that we have to give patients. And it is important that patients have a good understanding of what oxygen they need at rest what oxygen they need when they walk and what oxygen they need when they do exercise. As patients progress, even slight exertion, and that means from going to the, from sitting down in the chair to going maybe to plugging in the kettle for a cup of tea, you will need to put up that oxygen at a higher amount than when you're sitting down. Many of our patients don't uh, realize that and they often become very breathless uh, and they can, it can get very dangerous for them. It is important that the right amount of oxygen is used because over time, it will put strain not only uh, on the lungs themselves, but also on the, on the heart. And we often see patients coming to us with, with poor heart function and very swollen hearts, and they get very, very sick. And oxygen, of course, is very important for all the organs around the body, including the brain. So I can't stress that enough because that is something that we see time and time again in the clinic regarding the oxygen and not enough of oxygen uh, patients are on. So who is able to have a lung transplant? Well, that's where my job comes in because it it's an individual case. And when patients are referred to me, we, we, get, we have a special form that the doctor will fill out showing all your medications, all your medical history, how you were diagnosed, all your scans, and then we go through it and see, is this, some, is, is this person somebody that we think may be able to have, uh, uh, to see in the clinic and to be have an assessment. So patients that we, or people that we see in the clinic is people that we notice there's a drop in the lung function and the medical treatments aren't working. You have to be in good health otherwise with no other life-threatening illnesses. So patients who have kidney failure or heart failure or heart disease or cancers, those patients unfortunately are not going to do well with the surgery and with our medications. You need to have stop smoking and stop vaping and e-cigarettes and nicotine replacement and all that for at least 12 months before. 
we do advise patients to reduce their alcohol. Um, uh, the, the prob the, the, we do also stress that patients must be able to take tablets and must be able to adhere because unfortunately with lung transplant, there are lots of tablets to take for the rest of your life. So patients who struggle with that um, will, will have problems after transplant. You must be a healthy body weight. So being over or underweight puts, puts you at a lot of risk of complications from the transplant. And um, having a good um, uh, support system in place is also very important. And that's one of the most important things. Uh, having a network of family, friends nearby to help the patient is really important. We do see patients who are older and we certainly see patients who are over 65 and over 70, which is very different from many of my other colleagues who, who work in other transplant programs. However, it is fair to say that as you get older, and certainly when you get into your 70s, you acquire additional problems that are age related. And when you have a lung transplant, this can make patients much, much frailer and they can get more and more complications. And often the complications can be very severe and may shorten somebody's life. So we are very um, careful when we see patients and place patients on active lists who are a little bit older. You have to, you should all be involved in pulmonary rehab and walking um, because frailty, unfortunately, is, is strongly associated with, with a poor survival after transplant. So there are four stages that I say that are uh, that to in order to kind of get through transplant. One is the referrals, that's meeting the doctor in the clinic. If we think that this it, the you, you are suitable for transplant, we do what's called a lung transplant assessment. So a lung transplant assessment is a series of investigations looking at your heart, looking at your lung. Uh, it might involve looking at your tummy, looking at your bones to try and see are there any other diseases in any other parts of your body. You also will be asked to see some of our multidisciplinary team. Um, and these are the surgeons, the anesthetists, the nurses and physiotherapists that work with us. Everybody is, is also evaluated by a psychiatry doctor and a uh, social worker. And that's just to make sure that you have good support uh, and that won't, that won't put anything at risk if you had a transplant and you would be able to come and see us in the clinic and, and um, you would sort of let us know if something was going wrong. Because we also, I suppose, have an obligation to the donor that we have to find a right match for, um, for the donor family so that we can get as much, um, I suppose, um, longevity for the recipient as well. Because donor families often will, will contact us to know how, um, or contact the organ procurement office to, to know how the uh, recipient is doing. There'll obviously be um, blood tests involved and x-rays and um, stopping smoking, I've mentioned already. We do like people on as low dose of morphine and, and uh, sleeping tablets as possible because that will interfere with medications we give afterwards. And making sure your vaccines are up to date and, and our coordinators who are the nurses involved in transplant assessment then become your link um, if there are any questions from going forward. But why may you not be suitable or what kind of things, um, why, why may it not be your best option? Well, some patients, unfortunately, who come to us have maybe other medical illnesses or may not be strong enough to go through a surgery. Lung transplant is a major operation. It lasts many hours, six to eight hours. Patients can have complications during the surgery that can interfere with their heart and their brain. It puts a strain on other organs. And we give from the get-go important, very powerful immunosuppression that basically wipes out your um, immune cells. And remember that the lungs, where they are situated, they're situated open to the atmosphere, you know, so anytime you inhale, any of the bugs that are around obviously go into those lungs. It's a little different to the heart and the kidney and the liver, which are nicely tucked inside. So lung transplant patients, unfortunately, will get higher amounts of infection and rejection as a consequence to that. 
some patients unfortunately have psychological issues afterwards and they may not be able to kind of adhere to our strict re regime of coming to the clinic and and taking our tablets and reporting um abnormal um you know symptoms that they may have but we will work with these patients with our psychiatrists and social work to see whatever we can do to try and make them uh, have good support um, then I mentioned again about the frailty and deconditioning, and that's why the pulmonary rehab and having good oxygen is really important. Um, if you've had a recent cancer history or heart attack, that may also be considered not, not suitable. Some patients have very significant infection risk, and with our, our tablets, that could also um, make this, this, this in, these infections much more severe after transplant and a much bigger issue than they already are. So... If when patients are assessed, the next step then is that their case is discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. And at that team meeting, the surgeons and the anesthetist and the physicians and the nurses all sit down and we all review each case and all the tests that you had done and all the people that you saw. And if we think that we could actually give this patient a good chance of survival with a lung transplant, then we place patients on what we call an active wait list. So an actual wait list is a wait list waiting for an organ to become available that matches your blood group and matches a thing called your antibodies, which lowers your rejection risk. But it has to be based also on your size of your lungs. So not everybody, of course, we're all built differently. We all have different sizes. So we have to make sure that the lungs um, would also fit. And with pulmonary fibrosis, patients with chest cavity off, will often reduce, especially um, with advanced pulmonary fibrosis. So there is a lot of discussion around size matching when an organ becomes available. Sometimes patients may be called in multiple times, what we call false calls, because, of course, at the donor site, we may not know initially if the lungs look good or that the bloods match. So we often will have to get the patients prepared and ready for theatre, but then unfortunately it may not go ahead. That can often be very uh, stressful for people when they, when they learn this, that their operation may not happen. Some, some of our patients are... Some of our patients may be too sick to wait at home um, for, um, for a transplant. And these patients are often patients who require a lot of oxygen that is too high to be delivered in a home environment. And many, some, some patients, this small group of patients that unfortunately will have to wait in hospital until a transplant uh, becomes available. We do have a very good palliative care system here. So they, collaborate with us um, when patients are, are an inpatient at, at giving support, both psychological support and also uh, help us to manage breathlessness um, as, we, as we try and um, get patients ready. Some patients may have to come off a wait list if their illness becomes too severe and we feel that we won't, we won't be able to safely bring them through an operation. Um, patients should still go to their clinic doctor, their low, own lung doctor, um, who knows them well. And we have a shared care approach, really, between ourselves and the, and the lung doctor uh, until transplant. And I suppose it's important to say that not everyone will get a transplant. We're waiting. We, we have to wait for organs that become available. And sometimes pa patients may get too sick for that. We do have psychology and psychiatry services that work with us and our coordinators who are fantastic at giving support to patients and we understand how stressful all this is and all and 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 and, and how and what patients are going through so there is a team of people working with us to try and support the patient so i'll just see if i can I'll just see if i can um i'm not sure what i just did there so I was trying to play the video. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is a video of a lung transplant surgery. This is a double lung. And what we do is we, they make it, the surgeons make a clamshell incision. So incision is made, the clamshell is just underneath, underneath the breastbone. And you'll see here the right and left lung are exposed. So the vessels and airways are divided very, very carefully. And the left pulmonary artery is, is divided first if the left lung is being removed out. 
the surgeon will very carefully then have to remove the pulmonary veins and making sure that the atrium, which is part of the heart, doesn't get damaged. And then we'll carefully dissect away the left side of the airway, which is called the bronchus, and move that off. Then they, their job begins, at, uh, and this can often be the hard job actually trying to remove the old lung, um, because often it can be well stuck down. Then the, they have prepared the new lung and the, the three vessels that they have to anastomose or, or stitch together, the bronchus and the artery and the vein, making sure that they all work together and they're all nice and pink and healthy at the time uh, at the end of the case. Then if patients are listed for a double lung, the same must happen on the other side. And as you can appreciate, all this time, patients are continuously being monitored by a anaesthetist and, and nurses to try and make sure that the patient's heart and lungs and everything else is working in tandem. So the risk of transplant surgery, there, there is there is a lot of risk with infections and bleeding. Sometimes the blood vessels get a little bit blocked. Sometimes the airway gets blocked. Sometimes fluid goes into the lung. Sometimes blood clots can happen. Rejection of the new lung can happen. But we, we, we try and minimize, obviously, the amount of risk that we possibly can when we list patients. But... Um, like anything, you sometimes don't know what may happen, and um, but, the, but the intensive care doctors who will look after you are extremely well experienced in the matter at looking after lung transplant patients. They've done it now for over 17 years, and many of our doctors will have trained in other centres throughout the world and have bring great experience, and we have great success rates when, with lung transplant despite any, but despite problems that can sometimes arise. Just to say that the reality for lung transplant for some patients uh, is, is something new because they may have to come, to, they will have to come to the hospital a lot more. So a lot more clinic appointments. Sometimes patients will require um, admission into the hospital a lot more, and that can be for a variety of reasons. It's the infection and rejection are the two most common related to transplant. There's a lot of tablets that have to be taken. The immunosuppression tablets, which are the um, uh, the big tablets, the anti-rejection tablets have to be taken for the rest of your life. We do regular lung function, regular bronchoscopy, making sure that those lungs look okay, because sometimes early rejection may not show in lung function or on CT scan. Long-term survival, well, immunosuppression can cause problems with the kidneys. It can increase the cancer rate, especially skin, and infections are very serious. It is important to say that transplant patients don't have the same response to treatments and often they have unusual causes and unusual infections because their immune system is dysregulated. And they will always have long-term follow-up in the matter because we, we, have, we, we will mind these patients for, for forever really, making sure that everything is okay and uh, looking after their lungs. There is information that is available on the MASHER website for anybody that's interested. If there's an information booklet, it is very, it is very detailed, uh, but we do give this booklet out to the patients undergoing assessment. It is important to say that unfortunately, lung transplant anywhere in the world is not, doesn't have 100% survival. We are unfortunately, despite the best uh, experts, we, we still have problems with chronic rejection and infection, and um, the average lifespan for somebody with pulmonary fibrosis is about 6.6 .6 years. Um, our our numbers in Dublin are good. We have now got, uh, over, over the last 15 years, looking back at the data, our median survival is about eight years. That means that half of people will survive up to eight years, but half will live longer, and we have many patients who live much longer than that um, and, and who see us in the clinic. So I suppose just to conclude then, asking your lung team to review your oxygen prescription regularly is important. I've stressed that. And being involved in pulmonary rehab and getting a stationary bike at home and being on the most appropriate of oxygen level for you is also important. Keeping a healthy body weight with good muscle strength is key. And um, our lung, the, your, seek help from your own lung team in trying to help you to do that. 
Lung transplant can be very successful for certain patients and can improve survival and quality of life. And there's very big commitment for both patients and family. Um, but the team are here to support you in order to try and, 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 and have a successful transplant. So I'm happy to take um, any other any questions. Thanks for that. Uh, plenty of questions coming in. <laughs> you, you've actually raised a lot of questions here, Michelle, and I see that some of our panelists are answering questions in the Q&A box by text as well. Um, a question that comes up quite regularly, I think, is, is there an ideal weight for patients when they're trying to get a transplant? Uh, yes. So we try and target a body mass index of 28. So that's based on your height and your weight. And there's a formula that you can get online to see what your own body mass index is. So the, but I, I caution to say that, so 28 is what we target and what we list patients with, but it is important to say that sometimes patients in pulmonary fibrosis will lose a lot of muscle in their arms and their legs. And we don't want that to happen either. So we will work with patients, you know, and our dietitian will work with patients in order to get the, the to, to, to boost that up. But 28 is, is, is on the upper end. On the lower end, we will not transplant anybody less than 18. So BMI of 18. So ideally somewhere, somewhere in that middle. Okay. And I'll just throw in another quick question. Um, is there much work on the development of artificial lung and is Ireland working in this area? Mm. Yeah, so you probably saw recently the artificial pig heart in the States and um, obviously that's generated a lot of interest. The lungs are particularly tricky. The lung <laughs> lungs, unfortunately, I mean, when I worked in Toronto, we had pig lung models that we worked on to try and do research for. It hasn't quite got to the stage of doing pig lung transplants. That's not to say that it won't, won't happen. There is certainly having, doing this pig heart has certainly generated a lot of interest in what we call xeno transplants, animal tra uh, transplanted humans. Um, not, no, we haven't, not in the matter. We, we, we're not working on it, but there are centers throughout in, in the world that are trialing things. But unfortunately, lung transplant it always lags a little bit behind because it's a little bit more complicated than the other organs. But you never know. We may we may get there. Very last, very quick question. I know there's loads coming in now at the moment. Uh, you mentioned the average is 6.6 .6 years post transplant. Is it the same for a double transplant? Um, no. So double so, so that's a yeah, it's a good question because it it, it depends. So double transplant, in, in, we try and do a double lung transplant for younger patients less than 65 if we can at all, because that definitely will give a better survival. Some patients can go up to seven, eight years. The difficulty is when you get a little bit older, and many patients may come to us in their late 60s, early 70s, doing a double lung transplant is a long old operation. That's 12, 13, 14 hours. And patients tend to get lots of patients <clears throat> when we do a double. So in order to try and get good survival afterwards, we often will do single lung transplant because it is better for them to get an offer of a single than a double. And I also should say that double lung transplant is very difficult to get, much more harder to get a single a double than a single because of our organs that are available and some of our patients are really in dire need of a lung of some sort so we have we, we do try and and uh to try and save their life we, we sometimes just have to have to give singles and and hope that they will get as good benefit as those that would have double but sometimes it may not be the case thanks for that michelle I, i'm just conscious of time so i'm going to hand back to eddie and thank you very much for your presentation thank you, justin thank you and uh Thank you, Dr. Murray, for your great presentation. Our next speaker is Elaine Craven. Elaine is a respiratory advanced nurse practitioner at the Connolly Hospital, Blanchardstown. Elaine is a fellow and honorary teaching associate of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Elaine's presentation is called Little Perspectives on Living Well with Pulmonary Fibrosis. So Elaine, I'll just hand over to you now and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my slides. Is that okay? That's perfect, yeah. 
I'll just, um, is that okay? Can everybody hear me okay? We, we can hear you. We, we don't see your slides yet. Oh, I, I've just, I've just shared the screen there. Um, just actually. Give me one second here. One second. I think I know what I what what I may have have done. Can you see them now, Justin? I don't know. Um, I'm just seeing. Do, do I have a copy of your slides here? Uh, I do, yeah. I can I can share your slides here if, if need be, Elaine. Just one second. Um, I think oh, I'm you're, you're, you're just coming up now. Yep. Yeah, if you just want to go full screen. That's it. Yep. That's perfect. Okay. And everybody can hear me all right? Yep. Perfect. Okay, um, well, good morning or good, almost good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to Ilfa and Gemma in particular for inviting me to speak today. I think I'm probably going to change the vibe a little bit now um, after all that, that high tech stuff. So I just want to talk to you in very general terms about um, living well and the concept of, of wellness. So I've kept my presentation quite um, visual because I'm I'm treating I'm taking the approach of more that I'm having a chat with with you guys here today. So the the concept of wellness is is not a new concept. Um, Aristotle described it as the 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 good life consisting in the possession over the course of a lifetime of all those things that are good for us. And Aristotle referred to th to things like our bodily goods, health, vitality vigor, external goods like food, shelter and clothing and sleep, and then goods of the soul like knowledge, love, friendship, self-esteem. So the concept of wellness is it, it, the, the idea of wellness around those subjects hasn't actually changed too much, but probably the language around it um, may be different. And it's much more to the forefront, as we know, in the past couple of years. Um, so the, the Global Wellness Institute describe wellness um, as the active pursuit of activities, choices and lifestyles that lead to a holistic state of health. And I like this idea that it's an active pursuit. It's something that we're always striving for. It's, it's something that we, we, that we don't just acquire and have. It's something that we actually have to work at and, and, and requires some action and some effort. So I suppose an inherent in that then is the idea um, that there's a, a self responsibility or a self stewardship over, you know, of, of what we do on a day to day basis that helps us engage in, in life in, in a meaningful and fulfilling way. And um, it goes very much beyond our physical dimension. It's much more of a holistic and um, it's, it's an integration, I suppose, of our physical, mental and, and spiritual beings. So it's about fueling our body and engaging our minds and, and nurturing our spirit and, and all that good stuff. So I think it's important when when um, sometimes we're diagnosed with with a, an illness that, that that can become all consuming. And I think it's really important to focus on the other parts of our whole self and our, our lifestyle. Um, and what's meaningful for us. So, so this is, uh, these are the dimensions of wellness. So you can see that the physical part of our well-being is very much only one part of our, of our whole person. And it's important to maybe, to, to remember that we, we have, you know, um, intellectual potential. We're connected to an environment. We have very much, um, we're very much emotional and social beings and, and spiritual beings. Well, the, the and again, this will this will vary for everybody. It's very much a, a personalized approach to life and looking at the things that are important to you for our overall gen, general wellness. So um, this is what's known as as the well the illness wellness continuum. Um, it was proposed by John Travis, an American um, physician and author, who he, I suppose, he examined this idea of 
of, of the concept of wellness and felt that, you know, that often when we, when we are unwell or have an illness and we come in contact with, with health services, we tend to, the, the medical end of things tends to look at diagnosis and treatment, symptom management, which takes us to a neutral point. But, but actually, we can strive beyond that and look for other things um, that help to give meaning and, and purpose in our life and give us our enthusiasm for life. So I like the idea that, that illness and wellness are not particularly binary that some people, um, you know, that, that we look at that we're either well or we're either ill. And it's not, and he also says that it's not, it's not as important where we are on, on this, this continuum, but rather what direction we're facing and for, and for a lot of, um, for a lot of us to, to the positive outlook and how we feel um, and if we're looking in the right direction that that can often be more important than the actual point we are on this this um, health and wellness continuum I've gone the wrong direction there so some of, some of you may recognize this quote, it's from um, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist and he's a Holocaust survivor. And he spent a lot of his time um, during the Holocaust as, as um, a prisoner in the concentration um, camps um, and some time in Auschwitz. But um, Frankl really tried to look for meaning um, in life. And one of the things he said was that we must never forget um, that we may find meaning in life when confronted even with a circumstance that can't be changed. And what we see then, and it often, it often amazes me, the potential we have as human beings, you know, to, to look inward and to try and turn a predicament into something um, a, of a personal achievement or something that we can overcome. And so I like this quote where he says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we, we, are, in, we are challenged to change ourselves. So this is the wheel of life. Um, so sometimes um, legend has it that the Buddha himself was, um, did the first illustration of a wheel of life. And this doesn't necessarily have to be your wheel of life. Um, you can draw your own wheel of life. You don't have to engage. This isn't everybody's cup of tea. But again, um, it's just sometimes that when we're hit with one of life's blows, like a diagnosis um, of IPF, that's a tough diagnosis. And often we're, but often something like that can be seen as an opportunity, not an opportunity we, wouldn't, we would necessarily look for, but something that, that really challenges us to take stock or take an inventory of our life. So sometimes, it's an idea to sit down. The idea of the wheel of life is that on each spoke for each section, and you know, some of these sections might be relevant to everybody, that you, you mark yourselves, uh, you mark yourself on each spoke a score out of 10, and you connect the dots and draw your own wheel. And often it can be quite bockety, but it's a good, it's a good overview of maybe areas in your life that, that um, you could focus your attention on more so that everything isn't just being focused into illness. And you'll find then that when you start, you know, um, pers uh, you know, actively pursuing things in particular areas, that everything is interconnected. We start to feel better. Um, we start to feel more motivated and more inspired. And just generally that thing, that elusive thing that we're looking for, this, this business of, of living life well, it's really more about a, a, um, a particular feeling. So as you can see, I went quite ballistic with the clip art. Um, this is a very uh, busy uh, looking slide. Um, I couldn't undo it when I did it. So anyway, these are our usual suspects. So a lot of the time when, we, when we're talking about living well, we equate it with things which, which are, are, are the brass tacks really of, the, of our physical well-being is eating well and prioritizing sleep, getting creative or engaged in hobbies or, you know, or, or, or work. Um, and doing some exercise and then some time for rest and re rejuvenation as well. But what, what these essentially are, are, are habits. 
So there's been a lot of books written uh, recent, well, not recently, a long time. I've read a few books recently on habits and the power of habit. And our behaviours are generally something that are recurrent. They're cued by, specific, by a specific context and they're generally acquired by repetition. So they're, they're usually quite mindless behaviours, something that we don't think too much about. Um, and, and that's done for a particular reason, because we don't want to put too much we get up we do lots of things every day we get up we have a shower we have um a, you know to so to feel better we go at night and we brush our teeth or you know we boil the kettle we do a lot of things without without thinking about it and that's really because um, we're trying to conserve our brain is trying to conserve our energy but when we keep patterns over and over again they're very much automatic even if you think about driving your car stopping at a red light reversing we don't actually really think about that and that's that's kind of like a cognitive economy we have but when we actually try to to actively change our habits and these are the portion of our life that we can control it can actually be quite difficult um, so have you ever spent a whole day um, planning on going for a walk and you're, you're thinking about it all day long and then it, the walk never actually materialises and, and you've actually put a lot of effort into thinking about doing that walk that you didn't do. Um, and sometimes people talk about motivation and they don't feel particularly motivated to do something. Um, and often we think that um, action is the effect of motivation, but it can also be the cause of it. And this is where the do something principle comes into it. So we often think that we're going to be inspired or motivated and then we'll get up and we'll, we'll go for a walk or, or, you know, we'll start that healthy diet. But, but the, the, the inspiration train does, isn't that reliable, is it? And, and sometimes I think it was George Bernard Shaw that said, when I feel the need to exercise, I lie down until it passes. And, and, and a, lot, a lot of us um, can kind of be, behave that particular way. So sometimes the do something principle is basically about doing any small action. Um, even if, if it's to get up and do something for two minutes, he talks about the, the, this is from Mark Manson's book. He talks about the two minute rule that even if we just could commit to something for two minutes, and by doing something, that will serve as, as um, that's so you're starting with the action that will give you the motivation or the inspiration to, to get into healthy habits. He also talks about the two day rule, the try to commit something um, when you commit to something to not miss it for two days or to not go off track for two days. And then then again, when we're talking about, you know, whether it's going to bed um you know, at a reasonable time around prioritizing sleep is so important. And those of you who 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 don't sleep know the gift that that sleep is, and it's so important to to our general wellness. But the the habit loop is generally there's there's a cue. This is this is from the Power of Habit by uh, Charles Dewey. He talks about the the trigger for an automatic behavior, and um, then the routine, and then the reward. And, and, and to how we can change these little things that we do every day. So for example, a cue or a reminder might be the ad break on TV. Our routine might be to run and forage for refined carbohydrates. And the reward is that you've, you have had something nice to eat. But, he's, but try to, to you know, get a little bit more exercise and movement into the day. Instead, when the ad break comes on, maybe do some air squats, some deep breathing, something that makes you feel good and just some little routine that you can have it stack into your day. So trying to do things on top of what you would normally do is a good way of bringing things into your daily routine. And then habit tracking. It's always good to keep to keep track of what you do. We're, we're Sometimes you'd be surprised um, I started tracking my steps in work um, um, recently, and I was actually surprised how little I do. Um, so, so have a tracking, and I know Ilfa do their 2000 steps challenge, and that's a really good way to motivate you and to set some little goals on a daily basis. The, the other thing around habits is that they, the um, atomic habits written there by James Clear, um, the tiny habits, B, um, BJ Fogg, um, and the power of habit. It's all about just making little changes and small changes on a daily basis. So habits 
and the compound interest of self-improvement. And I like that idea. It's very easy to dismiss a habit of, of exercise or eating well or sleeping well on a daily basis, but it's a cumulative effect over time um, where we see the, the big changes um, that we make from, from small changes on a daily basis. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about um, very briefly about thinking well, because I'm very aware that Professor Kelly is going to be speaking with you shortly and he's going to sort all of our heads out. So I'm just going to, uh, I think it's important, the part of, of our living well is, how, our, is thinking well. And our thoughts have a lot of influence over our emotions and behaviours, but we also have a lot of influence over our thoughts. We probably have more influence over our thoughts than we, we give ourselves credit for. But mental wellness, it's an internal resource that we all have, and it's also a renewable resource. It's something that we can um, um, that we can strive to work on. Again, none of, of, of what I'm talking about today is the active pursuit of wellness, things that we can work on. Um, so I, uh, this quote that I have there again is by Frankel, and I really like this idea that between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space, we get to choose our response. So often, for example, when if you're feeling quite, if you're feeling quite breathless, we can start feeling quite anxious, and we can, you know, we can get quite stressed about it. And sometimes, it, it's a, if we can just catch the thought. So between that stimulus and how we react to it, there's a little opportunity in the middle for you to take back a little a, a bit of control there. So sometimes it's a good idea just to appraise the thought. Is it really, um, uh, you know, what happened the last time? Um, um, is this really, a, really, am I basing this on fact? And just to audit your thoughts a little bit. And that's really all I'm going to say about that there. Um, so the reason I put this slide up is because, um, and I, I'm very aware that a lot of you are at very different stages maybe along this. For those of you who are starting out on a journey or maybe have been newly diagnosed, you guys have a lot on your plate. There can be a lot to deal with. Um, and the reason I put this here was because one patient in particular a few years ago um, phoned me quite distressed because um, she was after getting so many appointments for all these different things in a language that that was all new to her and we tend to use a lot of, of medical jargon and even on, on appointment letters and she she didn't realize that we were all working towards the same goal but we probably failed to communicate that to the patient at home and I think it's very important to know what to expect that there is a lot at the very beginning with, with, um, with testing of lung function, blood testing, meeting the doctor, meeting the nurse, perhaps the oxygen clinic, the, all the, the allied health professionals like the physiotherapist, the maybe starting on new tablets with the pharmacy, um, the surgeons, and then we have family, we have um, support groups and we have palliative care. And so there's a, a lot of people looking for a piece of you at the same time. And that's a lot of organization in your life as well. When we, when you see, um, when all this stuff comes in the door and I know some people are great at outsourcing. I'd have a lot of people that say, well, well, Mary or, or Paddy looks after that end of things. But I think it's good to, good for, to keep the head straight to maybe you know, think of putting things into a diary or into a phone um, uh, some way of keeping organization on your appointments and getting to learn the language a little bit and understanding what the PFTs are and um, what's a CAT scan, what's an antifibrotic um, and, and all. But this is just for those of you um, who may be wondering why all the, um, we try to work very hard um, in our, our, I'm very proud of our own individual areas. And we forget sometimes that you're the one person in the middle that's at the receiving end of all of this. And um, it's just to help you understand that the, there, is, there is a lot involved and it can, it can, it can ebb and flow throughout the process. Um, so this is what I call the tough stuff. And, and I think um, um, Dr. Michelle and Sinead have spoken um, about this already. Um, just to say about oxygen therapy, 
again, just to, to emphasize the importance of it. And I know it can be incredibly difficult. And, you know, oxygen, having to start on oxygen therapy, it, it's another shift in your condition. It's also probably the first time, particularly if you're quite private, that you have to disclose publicly um, you know that that you have some condition, and um, because it's so visible for, and it can be, you know, it can be a blow to body image, and and it, it can be it can be hard, but it's incredibly important that you use the oxygen as prescribed. And I know people um, can sometimes develop their own systems because they don't want to um, to have to use it outdoors. But the, but the one tip I will give you is that. You cannot save up and you cannot catch up on oxygen. So wearing it at home for a little while before you go out and then putting it on you when you come home to top up doesn't work. It really has to be worn in real time exercise and, and movement. Um, just to say as well about the antifibrotics, um, yes, it's, it's wonderful that we have these drugs on the market, but for some people, um, the side effects can, can be quite disruptive to their life and very hard to tolerate. And I find a lot of people are quite good at taking the anti-diarrheal medication, but often suffer on with the nausea and won't take the anti sickness tablet. And I really think it's important for your overall wellness that, that you, you take the little tablet for the sickness to see what that helps. And, and just a final thing on, on the antifibrotics is don't persevere with them at any cost um, and, and talk to us about them when you come into, come into clinic. But um, I, know, I know a lot of people will, will keep going with them and suffer awful side effects. And I know some people are on them and they don't suffer any side effects at all. So I think, um, but, and it's very, very much individual. Um, I'm not gonna talk, talk um, about the other stuff there um, in the interest of time. Um, I'm just going to say briefly, um, other, other things we can do that can keep ourselves well, but both mentally and physically. And I think um, the, over the past two years, this kind of stuff, and I know some of half, I may have lost half the room by now, but, um, but things like grounding exercises, trying to keep ourselves focused. When we get a diagnosis that, that, that may be life limiting, it can be we can get very future focused and very worried um, about what's going to happen down the line. And, and, and that is understandable, but it's also important to try and think of what we have now in the present moment. And sometimes we can do some grounding activities like looking at five things you can see, five things you can touch, five things you can hear. That can be a quite good one to distract you from maybe uh, when you feel that there's some anxiety using the calming hand so recognizing an emotion, name it to tame it, sighing, um, taking a sigh out, inhaling, exhaling, that kind of thing. These are some of these things you can do quite, um, quite discreetly when you're waiting on a hospital appointment. That would be a kind of a habit stack as well. Um, you know, or before I go to bed, before I turn off the light, I'm going to do um, some deep breathing. I'm going to think of three good things. It's also important, and it's actually one of the things that Frankel I talked about as well was um, by creating work or doing a good deed. Don't forget that, that you're still in a position to do things for other people. I know um, if for some people, everybody wants to be able to help you when you're feeling, feeling unwell um, or have an illness, but it's okay for you to want to help and do good deeds as well. And that's an important part um, of, of your, your um, whole being. Um, I'm going to give the last word to, to James Joyce. Um, as you can see, I'm a fan of quotes, but this is a little mantra that, that I like to say um, to keep me on the straight and narrow. So I am tomorrow or some future day what I establish today. I am today what I established yesterday or some previous day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um... I, I like to, I like some of the quotes as well about exercising as well. That I I'm probably that type of person that lies down and hopes it goes away. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On that basis, uh, thanks to all the panelists who've been answering the questions in the background. Uh, there was loads coming in, and we've been trying to answer them as much as possible. I know a lot of people are waiting for a comfort break, so I think that's what we'll do, Eddie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh,
Just <laughs> unmute yourself there, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> I thoroughly agree with you. Yeah, I thoroughly Absolutely. agree. Okay. Cup, cup of tea. <laughs> cup of tea time, and then we'll yeah. come back with... We'll, we'll come back then, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank guys. you, everybody. So, welcome back, everybody, for part two. And our next speaker is Sarah Cunin. Sarah is a clinical specialist physiotherapist in pulmonary rehabilitation in Community Healthcare West. She also works part-time at the Tala. University Hospital on a pulmonary rehabilitation e-health project. Sarah's presentation is entitled Benefits of Exercise. So I'll hand over to you now, Sarah. Thank you. Hello. I hope you can hear me and see my screen okay. Yeah, that's coming. Yes. Brilliant. Thanks a million for having me this morning. I'm going to speak to you about the benefits of exercise. So what I'm going to speak about today is why exercise, what type of exercise you should do, what pulmonary rehabilitation is, we've heard it mentioned a bit already this morning, um, what the challenges of exercising would be, and building a habit, which Elaine spoke about there this morning as well, and exercise resources that are available to you. So first of all, why exercise? So people with interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis often have a reduced exercise capacity and shortness of breath during exercise. So exercise is recommended for people with pulmonary fibrosis and it improves the ability of your muscles to use oxygen. It improves your cardiovascular fitness. It strengthens your muscles and helps prevent deconditioning. And Dr. Michelle Murray was speaking about this this morning as she described how the muscles can get a bit weaker and exercise can help to prevent this and also can help to I suppose, build up your strength so that you can fight infections and would get you ready for a lung transplant if you were yeah. waiting for one. And also exercise improves your quality of life. Exercise also can help to decrease shortness of breath, improve your energy levels, reduce stress, help you sleep better and improve your mood. So there's lots of benefits of exercise. And exercise is listed here as one of the treatments for people who have pulmonary fibrosis. So as we heard about this morning, there's medications, oxygen, supportive care from your team and lung transplant, but also exercise, especially pulmonary rehabilitation classes are a really important treatment. So this is a cycle of inactivity. So just to go through this with you, sometimes if you feel breathless, you avoid doing things that make you feel more breathless. And that might lead you to do less activity, less moving around, and your muscles then can become weaker. Weak muscles can use more oxygen and are less efficient, and it can make you feel more breathless. So I suppose what this is showing you is, is that if you have breathlessness, you may become fearful of activities that make you more breathless. And then you might spend a little bit more time sitting down. And then the next time you go to try and do an activity, your breathlessness might actually be a little bit worse. On the other hand, this is a positive cycle of activity. So as you keep moving and do more activities to help your breathlessness, your muscles become stronger. Your muscles use oxygen more efficiently. You're less breathless, breathless and tasks become easier for you. And you feel better about yourself because you're able to do those tasks. You're motivated then to continue to be active because you've had a positive experience with it. And then you do more activity and that in time again helps your breathlessness. So I suppose this is showing you that if you aren't moving around, you can get a bit weaker and that can make you feel a little bit more breathless and you can find it harder to do tasks then again if you try and do them whereas if you keep it up and do a little bit every day and keep doing your exercise keep moving around your house then your muscles can become stronger and you can feel less breathless so what types of exercise am i talking about so there's kind of three different types of exercise there's aerobic exercise strengthening exercise and flexibility exercise. So I'm gonna go through the three of them, but while I'm talking through them, just have a think about what type of exercise you enjoy, because it's important that you enjoy the exercise that you're doing and that you can use it to form a habit. So 
So firstly, aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise involves continuous exercise and it uses large muscle groups. So examples of it would be walking, that could be outside or it could be on a treadmill, cycling. So Dr. Marie spoke about having a stationary bicycle, dancing and swimming. So you should try to do some aerobic exercise three days per week, preferably up to five days per week if possible. The guidelines would say you should try and do 150 minutes of exercise a week. So you should try and break that down because that seems like quite a lot and exercise for about 20 to 60 minutes at a time. If you're not able to do this, just try to accumulate over 20 minutes of exercise, but you can intersperse that with rest periods. So you can do 20 minutes of exercise and then take a break. And then maybe later on in the day, do another small bit of exercise. So you don't have to do it all at the same time, but try to build up so that you're doing some sort of an aerobic exercise, like going for a walk, doing a cycling um, three days per week. The next type of exercise is strengthening exercise. So that's designed to increase the strength of specific muscles or groups of muscles. So we would commonly get people to do strengthening exercises of your arms or your legs, and they can be done using dumbbells, which is in the picture there, um, exercise bands, ankle weights, or weight machines, or even just using your own body weight. So climbing the stairs or standing up and down out of a chair, which we'd call sit to stance. You should try and do strengthening exercises at least two days in the week. And that will be on non-consecutive days. So we need to give our body a bit of a rest as well when you're trying to build up the muscle strength. So for example, if you do uh, strengthening exercises on a Monday, you wouldn't do them on the Tuesday just to give your body a little bit of rest. And generally, if you could try and do 10 repetitions of each exercise, that would help you build up your strength. So I've taken some exercises here from the British Lung Foundation, just to give you an example of things that you could do um, at home. Like Elaine was saying there, you know, if you're watching television, maybe and an ad break comes on, this could be something that you could do to build up to that 20 minutes of exercise slowly throughout the day. So the first um, diagram there is showing somebody doing a press up against the wall. So it would be like push ups that you do on the ground, except you're standing up. So they're much easier from that perspective. Um, so you can see the person has lined themselves up against the wall, they have their hands um, against the wall and they're just bending and straightening their elbows. So just important when you're doing this not to do it, for example, against the door, just in case somebody comes in through it. The second exercise, somebody um, is going up and down on their toes there. So you could do that maybe at your kitchen counter while you're waiting for the kettle to boil, just to get a little bit of movement into your daily routine. The next exercise, somebody is holding on to a weight, that's the one in the middle. So that's the dumbbells again, and they're bending and straightening their elbow to try and strengthen up their arm muscles. And if you don't have any weights at home, you could pick up a tin of beans or something in the kitchen that you'd be able to lift up and down and do 10 repetitions of. And then the last two are in sitting. And these are nice ones maybe that you could do while watching television. So the first person is just straightening out their knee. And what I would say is if you can hold that for about three to five seconds while the knee is actually straight and then put the foot back down where it was on every second leg. And the last one is just marching on the spot while sitting down. So there's some ideas for exercises that you could maybe incorporate into your day to day activities. And the final type of exercise that we refer to is flexibility. So that's activities that improve the ability of your joints to maintain their movement and that would be necessary for carrying out your daily tasks. So you could stretch for about 30 to 60 seconds and complete these exercises two to three times per week. And the Irish Lung Fibrosis Association have a yoga DVD that would show you some of these stretches. So there's lots of different ways to be more active in your day-to-day -day life, and I've given you a few examples there. But also it's important to think about moving more and sitting less. So for example, moving more would include walking up the stairs, doing a small bit of housework, maybe some gardening if you enjoy it, walking your dog, or playing with children or grandchildren. Sitting less then, so walking around when you're on the phone, or during TV advertising breaks, getting off the bus one stop early. So try to think of ways that you can break up long periods of sitting and increase the number of steps you take each day. Do you need medical supervision to exercise? So you should always get medical clearance from your doctor before starting an exercise program. So if you are thinking of starting to do a little bit more exercise, mention it to your doctor so that they're aware. How do you monitor your exercise? 
So symptoms of shortness of breath can be monitored on the Borg scale, which I've shown here. It's a scale from zero to 10. And it describes the feeling of shortness of breath. It uses numbers and words to describe it. So zero would be no shortness of breath at all. And 10 is the maximum amount of short breath. When you're exercising, you will become a bit breathless and that's okay. And that's showing that you are exercising at a level that is going to, I suppose, help strengthen you and help improve. So it is recommended that you're in and around the three to four range for exercise. So that would be moderate to somewhat severe breathlessness. And then this would help you feel less out of breath when you go to do daily everyday tasks. So like I was saying with the cycle of, of activity, if you're making yourself safely breath breathless while you're doing a bit of exercise, then you're going to be continuing to strengthen yourself up and you will hopefully find that your day-to-day -day tasks become easier. So just a couple of questions have come in on this this morning as well, how to monitor your exercise. So if you experience any of the following symptoms with exercise, I advise you just to stop immediately and follow up with your doctor and let them know. So any dizziness or lightheadedness or visual changes or chest pain. So what's pulmonary rehabilitation then? So pulmonary rehabilitation is a group exercise class. It's run by physiotherapists and nurses. It's usually an eight week program. Sometimes they're a little bit shorter, a little bit longer. Um, the exercise class is usually twice a week. And then there's an education component as well, which would be once a week. So it's a program that you would be referred to by your doctor. And if you haven't been referred to it, I'd advise you to ask your, your doctor about pulmonary rehabilitation. As you've heard this morning, it's um, been mentioned in nearly all the presentations as a really key component of your treatment. It can be run um, in face-to-face -face settings, which is what we always would have done really before COVID-19. And now we can also run it virtually. So you can stay in the comfort of your own home and do pulmonary rehabilitation on a video call like this today. So the aims of pulmonary rehabilitation are to improve exercise capacity, your, improve your muscle strength, reduce the burden of your disease and reduce the associated symptoms that you'd have with your disease. So that would be, for example, breathlessness or fatigue. And the exercises that we would do in pulmonary rehabilitation are similar to the ones that I showed you the pictures of there, but also when you're in pulmonary rehabilitation and you're doing walking or cycling or you're doing those wall push-ups or sit to stands, we're there with you as physiotherapists and, and nurses are there as well in some programs and you know we're there to monitor you and to support you through the, the exercise. So if you are feeling a bit breathless, if you're being watched, you have somebody there to check your oxygen levels. Um, so it's really safe and supportive environment for you to start exercising in. This diagram just shows the best practice in interstitial lung disease regarding pulmonary rehabilitation. So the green cog there is exercise training and that's slightly bigger than the yellow one there, which is non-exercise training because there's a bit more evidence for exercise training. However, non-exercise training is also really important. Um, so the non-exercise components would be, for example, some psychological support, the education programs that you'd be invited to as part of pulmonary rehabilitation, and advice about controlling your symptoms that we would give you throughout the classes. And then the exercise training, that includes all the different types of exercise that I was speaking about earlier, and oxygen supplementation as well. And then from those two cogs, you'd be expected to have outcomes of reduced dyspnea, which means reduced breathlessness, and improved quality of life, and improved exercise capacity. So that's improved fitness and improved mood as well. And research supports the inclusion of pulmonary rehabilitation as part of the management for people with interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. So this is um, a Cochrane review, and this is one of the most highest levels of evidence that we would look at um, when we're deciding what treatments to offer patients. So this one is about pulmonary rehabilitation. And I just said I'd pick out a couple of pieces from it um, to give you examples of what the outcomes of pulmonary rehabilitation would be. So it found that immediately following pulmonary rehabilitation, people could walk further than those who hadn't undertaken it. So people improved how many meters they walked during a six minute walk test. Participants in the research also improved their maximum exercise capacity. So they reported that they were less short of breath, they'd improved quality of life and that they could walk further. And then six to 12 months after completing the program, they actually could still walk further than those who hadn't undertaken it. And they sustained more improvements in shortness of breath and quality of life. 
And finally, it showed that pulmonary rehabilitation can be performed safely in people with interstitial lung disease as well. There's a lot of challenges to exercise. Um, so I'm going to speak through some of them now. So one might be um, an increased symptom of cough. So if you have um, a persistent dry cough, that's a symptom that you suffer with, then it can make exercise more difficult. So I would just advise you to stop and have a rest if you experience a coughing spell during exercise and get it under control and then you can start exercising again. Fatigue um, can also increase. So it's important to pace yourself for energy conservation. So your work and household activities, they require moderate levels of exertion and exercise too. So plan out your daily tasks and your exercise program. So in one of the previous slides, I was speaking about um, sitting less and moving more. So it's important if you are going to try and move a bit more, you need to plan out your day as well so that you don't run out of energy during the day. So say, for example, if you're planning on going to a pulmonary rehab class or doing exercise or going for a walk on a certain day, maybe you mightn't do some housework on that day. You might leave that to a, a different day where you're not planning on going for a walk. So you're spreading out the amount of energy that you're using over the week so that you don't feel tired. And another symptom that I mentioned can increase is breathlessness. So with that Boric scale from zero to 10, if your breathlessness is greater than four, then you should stop and, and follow the stall breathing technique. So that is to stop what you're doing, to try to remain calm. Uh, you can turn up your oxygen if you use it as well. I see a comfortable position and I'll, I'll go through those in the next slide. Let your imagination take you to a safe place. So imagine yourself there relaxing. And that's what Elaine was speaking about earlier around just trying to, you know, Distract yourself maybe by um, being aware of what you can see or feel or smell around you and trying to distract yourself from that breathlessness. And then just let your breathing return to normal. When your breathing has returned to normal, then if you have turned up your oxygen slightly, you can turn it back down and you can continue with your exercise. Maybe push yourself a little bit less if you were pushing yourself a bit too hard and your breathlessness increased over four. And if your symptoms don't have settled, then call for medical help. Other ways to um, contract breathlessness. So the diagram there of the man in different positions, that's what I was speaking there about trying to get into a comfortable position. So have a sit down or stand up and lean forwards. And you can see there um, the man is leaning forward on a chair. But if you're out and about for a walk, maybe you could lean on a wall or on a bench um, or on a gate. Backwards lean is, is a good one as well. So you could lean up against maybe a pole if you're out for a walk or a wall um, and forward lean sitting. So leaning forward on a table or just bending your elbows and leaning forward on, while you're sitting on the chair. So putting your elbows on top of your knees and just trying to get your breathing under control in those positions. As well, um, portable handheld fans can be useful to try to, I suppose, increase that feeling of air circulating around your face. If you're feeling breathless and then you're struggling to get it under control while you're exercising. So you've heard oxygen mentioned a bit um, today as well. So oxygen is commonly delivered during exercise training. And if you have been prescribed oxygen and told that your oxygen levels drop when you exercise, then portable oxygen might increase how much exercise you can do. So it's important that if you have an advice to use oxygen while you're exercising, that you do that. You know, when, as Elaine said, it's not something that you can use prior to exercising. You have to use it during the exercise. Significant planning is needed to organize oxygen supply to participate in exercise, particularly outside of your home. So speak to staff at your oxygen clinic um, and at the oxygen company that you use if you have difficulties managing your oxygen supply. So it's important that you're on enough oxygen. And Dr. Murray mentioned that as well, that, you know, you're not trying to conserve your oxygen. You're not turning it down because you're trying to make it last longer. There is solutions to that. So if you're finding yourself struggling with managing your oxygen, let your oxygen um, clinic, your doctor know um, so that they can give you some advice or maybe change the oxygen that you're on. So building a habit then, and Elaine spoke about this as well, but people who have pulmonary fibrosis who don't continue to exercise are more likely to lose the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation after six months than those who continue to exercise. So even if you've gone through that six to eight week program, it is important that you then keep up that habit and continue to exercise so that you keep the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation. So to do this, make a plan. So try to schedule exercise into your weekly activities. So 
have a look at your week and decide what days would be the best days for you where maybe you don't have a hospital appointment or you don't have a different commitment that you can do some exercise and try and build up to that 20 minutes of exercise if you can. And set goals. So if, for example, at the moment you can only walk for five minutes, then, you know, maybe try and see that if you continue to do that over a couple of weeks, that maybe you'll be able to walk for 10 minutes or set goals that you, you know, decide that you're going to um, do strength exercises twice a week. Like I was saying there, that's something that's recommended. So set that goal, write it down and make a commitment that you're going to do it. And Elaine was speaking about that as well, trying to build a habit um, and get into that habit of keeping it up. And there's different resources online and through the Irish Lung Fibrosis Association that could help you to continue to exercise. So there's an online exercise class and it's supervised by a physiotherapist Mondays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. So this is a really nice way to, um, I suppose, have a bit of support and a bit of um, encouragement while you're exercising. Um, but also it's a way that if you've maybe been through pulmonary rehabilitation formally um, in a face-to-face -face class or run by your local hospital, that you can continue to exercise then twice a week by doing these classes online. There's also YouTube videos. Um, so if you put into YouTube fit with fibrosis, these are videos that were developed by the University of Limerick and the Irish Lung Fibrosis Association. And they um, are unsupervised. So you'd be doing it on your own, but you know, you could do it any time of the day. So if the 11 o'clock classes didn't suit you, maybe you could do the YouTube videos. There's also a steps challenge. So maybe you could set yourself a steps goal. Um, so the Irish Lung Fibrosis Association have their 2000 steps per day. So trying to build up your steps to that. And also there are local exercise classes. And unfortunately due to COVID-19, a lot of these exercise classes maybe have, um, you know, closed down over the last two years, but hopefully we'll see them opening up now again over the summer and you might be able to go to one um, in person. So thank you very much for listening. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, there is a couple of questions that's been uh, coming in. Uh, one from Frank, uh, would you recommend a home sauna to relax? Um, I suppose it's up to yourself and, and how you're feeling in it. So just make sure that if you are using something like that, that it's not, um, you know, making your other symptoms feel a little bit worse. So just keep an eye on your breathing and on your, you know, those feelings of, like I was saying there, of, of dizziness and things, you know, if anything like that happens, you need to speak to your doctor. So if you're going to try something new out, just be very aware of um, of how it impacts on you and what the, the outcome of it is. But, you know, like Elaine said, there's lots of different ways to, to relax and um, definitely trying out different things and seeing what suits you is the best thing to do. There's a couple of um, questions there that are specific to and personal questions there in the Q&A box that I might get you to answer there. Yeah, I can write back to them. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, just conscious of time, so I'll pass back to Eddie. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. So our, our next speaker now is Professor Brendan Kelly. <clears throat> Brendan Kelly is a professor of psychiatry at Trinity College Dublin and consultant uh, psychiatrist at Tala University Hospital. His most recent book is Science of Happiness, The Six Principles of a Happy Life and the Seven Strategies for Achieving It, and is published by Gill Books. Professor Kelly's presentation is entitled Dealing with a Chronic Disease. So, Professor, I'll hand over to you now. Thank, thank you very much, um, Eddie, and thanks everyone for asking me along today. Um, how am I doing here on volume? Can, Justin, you seem to be yep. in charge. Yeah, yeah that's Brilliant. perfect, Brendan. <laughs> Great, listen. Uh, yeah, Brendan Kelly is my name. I'm a doctor, a psychiatrist, and I'm going to talk for just a short little, short little bit about um, dealing with a chronic disease. Now, there's been so much that's been really helpful so far this morning. I'm going to refer back to some of it. Uh, but I, I, will, I will start by hopefully sharing my screen. There is every possibility um, that this will not uh, work out, just so you know. Um, it's, it's working now. I, I have full, full faith in, in Zoom, <laughs> Brendan. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, good for you. 
Um, I, I, you know, when Zoom or PowerPoint don't work, you can always hear an entire audience uh, uh, breathe a sigh of relief uh, because finally someone, you know, someone's going to talk directly. But look, the slides are working, so let's let's do it. Um, and here's quite an important one um, because um, I write a good deal about happiness and well-being. Um, and I guess what I, you know, I was really struck earlier, those of you listening to Elaine, um, when she was showing the, the wheel of uh, the wheel of life, that, that, that concept, and you put in the points and Elaine, you said that the wheel of life, it can look quite bockety when you draw it out. And of course, the wheel of life can be very bockety while we're living it as well, it, it, you know, and yet there it is, it, you know, it, it carries on turning. And the big message I suppose that I want to get across is that each of us as a person, we are bigger than any specific problem in our lives. We are, you know, we are big creatures. So while we often struggle with diagnoses or personal issues and losses and bereavements, there is a, there is a, a me, there is a, you know, we are bigger than it and we navigate our way through the most astonishing things. If we reflect for a little bit about the pandemic, for example, if someone had told me three years ago or two years ago, you know, that there would be a global pandemic, schools would close, businesses close, travel would cease, um, and that people would live in a state of sustained anxiety and in their homes for so long. I would have predicted that nobody could cope with such a thing, that it was unthinkable. And yet, and yet somehow, um, here we are. It's bockety, as you might say, um, but here we are sitting here talking on Zoom, um, living with loss, living with limitation, living with illness, living with anxiety, but living with all of these things. And, you know, the big message for me has been about strength and resilience over the past two years, more than it has been about um, problems or uh, difficulties, although there have been those. So I want to talk a little bit about, about sort of living through, um, living with um, maybe a, a, a chronic illness or a, a chronic worry or a chronic problem of some sort. But first, some background information. I'm going to start with some really good news. Um, which is um, a, a little bit of the happiness research. Um, they've, studies have been done of happiness, and we've done some of these analysis, uh, asking people, you know, how happy are you, uh, to see are there patterns across populations. And I'm going to show you a graph that I really like. You can see across the bottom there, there is age from the age of 16 years up to 88, and happiness is on the vertical axis. And each line is a different country. Uh, Ireland is green. And you can see that we basically start out life uh, quite happy as children. We get steadily more unhappy in our 20s, 30s and 40s. And they, they, we reach a low point at the age of about 47. And this happens you know, across every country in which it's been studied, more than 130 countries now. And it all points to the fact that being aged 47, um, which is my age right now, as it happens, is likely to be the unhappiest time in life. Now, I don't quite know the age profile of everyone on this call, but I'm guessing that some of you are around the same age as me or a little bit older, and this means that things are going to get better. Now, those of you who are younger than this, um, you know, what this tells us is that uh, the challenges of life become greatest in midlife, but once we navigate that somehow, um, things tend to pick up in, in, in later life. So no matter how dark the valley of darkness is, and apparently I'm in the darkest part of that valley at the moment, uh, no matter how uh, dark it is, things do tend to pick up, uh, it would seem, uh, apparently because we, uh, we, we just don't care as much uh, in, in, in our later years about the kind of things that uh, worry us now. One of the key things, though, is about remaining physically well. And um, physical health is important. 
And we, we've had so much good advice today about specific measures that can be taken uh, in the context of lung disease and lung problems. I, I want to step back from all of that and talk, talk a little bit about how, we, how you move on from where you are now, how we move on from where we are, where we are today, because a lot of a lot of um, advice tends to look at perfection. And, you know, a lot of us, especially me, we're, we're a long way from that yet. Treatment, and I know Dr. Walsh and Dr. Murray spoke a great deal about this, is both essential and in many ways imperfect. And once we accept that, that we engage with it as best we can, um, this this will help with our mental well-being, our adjustment. In other words, it's the same in the pandemic with, with the public health advice as well. Once we obey it, once we stick with it, then that's that bit covered and we can focus on other things as it were. The number one piece of physical health advice is to do with sleep. And this was mentioned earlier. And there's a lot of sleep advice out there. But what we should do is not aim for the perfect amount of sleep or perfect sleep we should aim for more and better compared to last night. Okay, so aiming for perfection is not going to work out. So we aim for more and better. Diet as well, we, we, you know, the perfect diet, I'm never going to achieve it. So we aim to improve compared to yesterday, compared to ourselves yesterday. That's what we do. And the best dietary advice um, of which I am aware uh, is just this seven these seven words from science writer Michael Pollan that's that's him there and um, obviously this this advice mightn't do much for your for, for your hairline it would seem but the advice is eat food not too much and mostly plants uh, and if we can do that that would be great but if we can't what we do is we aim to improve our diet today compared to what it was yesterday and again um I'm going to use the exact same uh, way of approaching the issue of um, uh, activity, which is we improve today compared to yesterday. I have a long history of joining gyms. You know, the number of gyms that I've joined is impressive over the years, and the number of times I've gone to them can be measured on one hand. So, uh, so that's a perfect example of letting perfection um, sort of uh, hobble me um in in the present um but if i can do slightly more today than yesterday that will be progress and um sarah's advice there is obviously uh, very useful to keep that within um within limits so in terms of physical health uh, the big advice in terms of a chronic condition particularly one that's a bit limiting is uh, more than yesterday more and better very slightly more um but you're comparing yourself with yourself. You're not comparing yourself with the perfect person, people on social media. You're comparing yourself with yourself because that's the only valid comparison. Okay, more, more, more news, more good news. Okay, I'm full of good news today. I am all about the good news. This is the World Happiness Report, which is a very big report looking at happiness around the world. And it comes out every year and it figures out what the happiest countries in the world are. So hopefully it'll pop up here. Here we are. It's about 150 countries in this survey. And you can see here at the top, the happiest country in the world is Finland, number one out of about 150, followed by a load of other Scandinavian country, countries. The good news for us is Ireland is in there, number 15. We are a fairly happy lot. Uh, we rate our happiness about seven out of 10, most of us. And to boost that happiness even further, I can tell you we are happier than the United Kingdom. Um, we, not very much, admittedly, but we are happier than they are. So uh, we have a good starting point. And even if we all moved to Finland, um, it is unlikely that we would increase our happiness very much because we are probably as happy as a given country can make you. In the pandemic, levels of self-rated happiness haven't changed significantly. Amazingly, uh, we don't see ourselves as less happy and the rankings have barely changed 
at all. So uh, we're still around a seven out of 10, which is a good starting point when we're trying to navigate life's difficulties. You know, turning to mental health now uh, more specifically, uh, there's a couple of things that I want to highlight. Um, the first one uh, is to do with alcohol. Um, alcohol, you know, the, the World Health Organization used to produce um, guidelines about safe and unsafe amounts. They've stopped doing that now. The advice is much simpler. The less alcohol we drink, the happier we will be. It's as simple as that. Uh, so uh, the absolute perfect amount of alcohol would be zero. Now, that is not achievable in many people's lives because of their structure of their lives and so forth. But if you are struggling emotionally or psychologically, just do bear these words in mind. The less alcohol that you drink, the happier you will be and the less likely you will be uh, depressed. The other thing, even more addictive than alcohol, is comparing ourselves with other people, be it on social media or wherever. And it is important. We need to bear in mind a lot of our comparisons when we compare ourselves to other people and um, they're subconscious. So if you're, you know, if I'm uh, flicking through social media and I come across, say, images of uh, celebrities, I am comparing myself to them, even if I don't consciously do that. This can become quite ridiculous. So I might see a picture of, I, I don't know who's a famous celebrity, maybe Kim Kardashian. Does that name mean anything to anybody? Um, and, I, you know, if I look at pictures of her, my brain, heaven bless it, will compare me to her. Now, this is completely daft, as I think you will all know, because I am a balding middle aged Irish man and she is some kind of uh, social media celebrity with a team of stylists. The comparison is ridiculous. And yet my brain will do that. And even though it's logically dismissed, it has an emotional impact. Um, so comparing ourselves with other people, particularly on social media, happens very quickly and it does impact upon us. Um, so less of that will help. Now, help itself is very important. So asking people for help is something that we need to do more of. Um, this, you know, social contact is an essential part of this. When we can't manage something and we ask for help, we need to remember that giving someone the opportunity to help us helps them way more than it helps us. Now, we all know this. You know how good you feel when you assist somebody with something or get them out of trouble or, or if, you're this, you know, the, if you save the day. That just feels great for you. So exchanging help in social context, contexts is so important for our, our mental well-being. There are limits, of course, uh, we need to just not say yes to everything, but being part of a help giving circle uh, is important. And finally, my last point, and this is the most important point I have today, apart from the picture of my book at the start, which is obviously the most important point. But the second most important point I have today is this one, which is absorption, which is becoming absorbed in an activity such that you know, the world just disappears. And by this, I mean something like gardening, um, walking the dog, um, knitting, something like that. Uh, the, something that makes the world disappear out of your head for a period of an hour, or maybe two hours will pass, or maybe three hours, then you'll barely notice. That is an exceptionally nourishing state of mind, and that will help us through all kinds of things. We often hear talk about meditation and mindfulness being taught in schools. And these are really, really good skills, which is to do with focusing on the moment and letting all the worries about the past and the future, uh, trying to put them to one side. It is also very difficult to do this. Um, you know, try as I will, I, I do not look like that meditating monk in the top picture there. I've spent an awful lot of time trying and I've lost almost enough hair to look like him, but I have not attained that degree of calm. So we look for other ways. And a lot of people get this through exercise. Walking um, is a very good way to do it as we become absorbed in the movement or indeed 
knitting is a particularly good one. Um, and I've deliberately chosen a non-traditional image of knitting for this presentation because it has physical activity, little physical movements that absorb us. And uh, even better uh, than the mental nourishment is you, you, you have a lovely hat or a lovely jumper or a scarf or something at the end of your knitting. So the absorption activity uh, is perhaps my final and uh, most important point. I'm going to finish with a quote. Uh, we, we've had a lot of quotes uh, and it's about becoming absorbed. That uh, this is, uh, Thoreau is said to have said this. He mightn't have said it, but look, let's go with Thoreau for today. Uh, happiness is like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it will elude you. But if you turn your attention to other things, become absorbed in an activity, happiness and well-being will creep up on you. And the various problems, the troubles, the diagnosis, the treatment, the appointments, all of this needs to be set to one side for periods every day, at least 30 minutes a day of complete absorption, ideally an hour. Um, and then a lot of stuff settles for that period and you become better at dealing with the difficult times. So I guess my overall point here is to do with uh, the, the links between physical and mental well-being, be it the treatment that we heard Dr. Walsh and Dr. Murray about, the activity Sarah was talking about, or the sort of navigating the bockety wheel of life um, that uh, Elaine evoked so, so clearly. Um, these feed into the mental health side of things as well, um, along with cutting down alcohol, improving our diet a bit, trying not to compare ourselves with other people, valuing connection, but above all else, valuing those periods of time when you set all that stuff to one side and you're playing with the kids, you're playing with the dog, you're walking in the woods, you're looking out at the sea, you're knitting, or maybe you're sitting meditating or, or doing yoga. That is the most nourishing thing. Also, getting lost in a good book can help. And as it happens, um, I'm going to just stop there now before Eddie actively intervenes to, 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 to stop the product promotion. Oh, well, I think it's allowed that we you have to advertise your book at the end there. Uh, thank you so much, Brendan. I, just loads of people uh, commenting um, uh, uh, in the in the Q and A and in in the chat box enjoying that presentation. Uh, one question there: When we talk about happiness, are we talking about just the absence of sadness, i.e., contentment, or something even more positive, i.e., laughing? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Uh, there are two, two two people think about happiness in two ways. Number one is the laughter, the pleasure, the hedonism. You know, just the enjoyment in the moment, the thrill. And at the other side, contentment. Um, it's the difference between spending all your money at the end of the week on a really good weekend and then not eating or having any money for until payday versus saving up some of your money, you know, paying off the mortgage, saving up for a slightly better garden shed instead of following your following your favorite band across Europe or whatever. So we, we need both kinds of happiness in our lives. And it's good to think about this. Some of us tend toward the contentment and we need to work on a little bit more pleasure in the moment, whereas um, other people tend toward pleasure in the moment and could really do well with, uh, you know, devoting a little bit of time to uh, quiet accumulation of contentment. So the research looks at both kinds merged together, but it's a really good question because it's good to think, oh, hold on, do I prioritize happiness in the future more than I should rather than happiness right now in the moment? Okay, I'm just conscious on time. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much for, for joining us and I'll hand back to Eddie there. Thanks again, Professor. Really enjoyed it. Our next speaker is Dermot. Dermot Rafferty from Dublin. And Dermot is a retired airline pilot. And we are delighted to have Dermot to share his story with us today. So Dermot, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm 73 years old. And when Gemma asked me to uh, talk to you today, uh, I told her that I felt like a fraud 
because although I have been diagnosed with the IPF, I'm not unwell. I don't feel like a patient. But however, uh, she prevailed upon me to tell you my story. So here goes. In 2016, at a regular visit to my GP, she commented that she heard this crackling sound in my lungs. And uh, this happened again on a regular visit in 2017. So in August, I was referred uh, for chest x-rays. And the first x-ray led to a follow-up x-ray four weeks later for comparison. And as a result, of those chest x-rays, uh, she referred me to a consultant in St. James's Hospital. So I eventually got to see the consultant in St. James's in June of 2018. Uh, the consultant uh, ordered CT scans, breath tests, bronchoscopy, and all the usual tests that uh, are run when uh, IPF is suspected. Uh, eventually, in February of 2019, I was definitively diagnosed with IPF. And uh, in June of 2019, started Nintenadib. And uh, I've been on Nintenadib ever since. And the only uh, I suppose symptom in my life are caused by our side effects caused by the uh, the medication. Uh, once I was diagnosed uh, and given my general state of good health, I decided I would do my best to get ahead of the game and do whatever I could to slow down the progress of the disease. And uh, of course, the obvious one to start with was. Uh, pulmonary uh, rehabilitation and at the time those courses would have been held uh, in person in St James's but of course uh, my diagnosis uh, almost coincided with the start of our COVID pandemic so uh, things changed quite considerably. As it turns out uh, I did the pulmonary rehabilitation course but I did this uh, online uh, by Zoom. And uh, this was, I, I gather, the first time that St. James's uh, had done a course like this. And uh, I found that very successful. And of course, that has subsequently been followed up by the uh, ILFA's uh, running of virtual exercise classes twice a week, which I find uh, excellent. And uh, in the absence over the last two years of my uh, the capability of going to the gym, for instance, I found this uh, home exercise uh, really a great way to get a bit of uh, discipline, regularity into my, uh, my exercise. Some of the other uh, uh, resources that I discovered uh, over the last uh, two years were uh, ILFA and uh, the virtual exercise classes, which I've mentioned, but through ILFA, I've also participated in a Sing Strong program. Uh, ILFA provide information days like today, which I find uh, very useful because although I'm, I hope, at an early stage in the progress of this disease, I do get to meet and talk with people who are further along the road. Uh, initially, I attended the ILFA support group, which was held in person at the Carmelite Community Centre, where I met other uh, sufferers and uh, that provided a certain amount of uh, uh, support from a social point of view in as much as you could sit down and talk with people who had the same complaint as I had. Uh, of course, this all ended uh, when COVID struck, but uh, the support group still meets uh, from time to time, again, online, on Zoom, and uh, th that's quite adequate. Uh, 
some of the other resources uh, I've learned about but have not had occasion to use to date, uh, the clinical nurse specialist at James's uh, tell me they're always available if I need to, uh, to make a phone call. But uh, at the moment, uh, I'm very well. I'm trying to stay as fit as possible. And uh, ILFA provide great backup and information and education and support. And uh, I look forward to staying well and staying informed and educated by ILFA. So that's my story. Thank you, Dermot. Uh, you're a breath of fresh air and long, long, long may it continue. <laughs> and thanks again for sharing your thoughts and activities with us. A pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, that's Dermot. And if we could only have that for everybody, it would be brilliant. Anyway, my sincere thanks to all our speakers at today's event for their time, their expertise, their kindness. I think it was a fantastic series of talks. Organizing events like this take considerable time and planning, and I would like to extend my thanks to Gemma O'Dowd for all her hard work and dedication behind the scenes, and to Anne as well. We're enormously grateful to Justin Dawson for his expertise managing the technology to deliver this online event. Um, virtual events are here to stay, in my opinion, and we're very lucky to have Justin to support us, especially this morning at the start of our, of our uh, meeting. <laughs> this year, IFA is celebrating our 20th anniversary, and our success to date is due to the hardworking committee members who run the charity and thanks to our loyal and generous fundraisers. ILFA's work and events like this would not be possible without those hard, hard efforts. ILFA depends on fundraising and donations and all support is greatly appreciated. If you would like to fundraise for ILFA, please get in touch. I'm beginning to sound like Professor Kelly now. <laughs> If you are a family member, is a member of a club or a society, a company, please consider ILFA as a potential charity partner. We would welcome such an opportunity. We hope you enjoyed this Patient Information Day. And please, God, you will all join us for our next one. So on that note, I will thank you all again for your attendance today. I'm wishing you a lovely weekend. Please stay safe, Slonat. <laughs>